So about two or three years ago, I was very involved with uh, Video Club. And this clip that I'm about to show is was supposed to be a documentary on a, uh, a class of one of my teachers, Mr. Sephora. However, I never actually got around to doing it, and I ended up doing something else for that assignment, or however it went. I really don't remember exactly. But until recently, I found those files, and I think they're all complete. They're all intact. It was originally like an hour-long video. Um, I think as of right now, I've condensed it to 28 minutes. So there was a lot of stuff that I could have cut out. So there's like a bunch of shaking and stuff like that. And it was shot with, ironically, I still have the camera. It was shot with this potato camera right here. And uh, I'm surprised I was able to get the footage that I did. But three years later, I have it all edited down. And uh, I'm about to show it to you. So the one thing that I do want to say is that there's a lot of jump cuts. Uh, some of the footage was actually corrupted. So I had to cut out those pieces and stitch together what I could. Some parts don't have audio, some parts do. But for the most part, the whole lesson is there. And uh, Sephora, I gotta say, man, <laughs> I'm really sorry it took so long. I know I know, I was gonna do this over like a week and I had it all planned out too, but uh, it just never ended up happening. But anyways, um, I got it all edited down for you and I hope you enjoy. Um, cool. Natalie. What do you have? Okay, so one idea that was changing during his time is that the Earth was 6,000 years old and or very, very young, really. Although people thought 6,000 years, you know, back then, a long time. What's another, another idea? So the idea that species species were fixed and that all at the same time. So these are the two real kind of big ideas during this time. And what's another one there? Oh, uh, what cells were and where they came from? Boom. How many people got cell theory? And what are the three parts to cell theory? It's a quick little review just because there's so much fun. Noah? Everything's made of cells. Everything is made of cells? Everything living. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything living. And this was right during Darwin's time, actually, cell theory is made of cells. What was the other one? Cells come from pretty distant cells. Yeah. Cells from cells. There was this idea also during this time of spontaneous generation that given a little bit of sulfur and some nitrogen carbon and a little bit of lightning, that, you know, whoo, you know, butterflies flew out of the soil. That's how things happen. I mean, people were still figuring this stuff out. Who's the person that says that the Earth is older than we think it is? What's the guy, that, the contributor to this idea? And he wrote the first book on geology and published it. Darwin then took it with him on his journey. It came out a year before Darwin left. Kent? Lyle. Lyle. Charles Lyle. So you guys will need to just recognize his name because it's so important in our modern understanding of not just biology, but geology as well and all earth sciences. I mean, Lyle's the real contributor because Lyle's like, dude, there's processes happening here that we see today that um, have been happening for a long time. And that explains what we see. So who is this person then? Who's the guy that does this? Number two. See if you can remember this one. Who was the first person to claim that species change over time? There's two names I want you to remember. And I'll give you a hint. They both start with L. It's in your note. See if you can write it down. Number two, right here. There's two names that are in your note sheets that I want you to be able to kind of pull out and recognize. This person, he's the first person to really write down and publish that species change over time. And as far as ideas and science that were changing during Darwin's time, who got that one? Who got that species change? So this guy here, let's put this as number two on here. This person publishes and writes just before Darwin's time, about 40 years before, the late 
1800s, early 1800s. What was his name? Lamar. Lamar! Dude, I was right. Lamar. And he's the first person to really publish and claim that this, this idea that species change over time. And it really goes against this here, this other number two, that species were fixed and all at the same time. And he also makes the connection that organisms are connected to their environment, that the environment maybe shapes organisms. There's an association between where something lives and then how it looks. Okay? And that maybe they change to fit that environment. Maybe as climates or environments change, organisms adapt. But what does he get wrong? And it's a big one. It's a big one because he's forever known for this now. Sad but true. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be terrible to do a bunch of great research and then be known as the person that missed that one thing? Lamarck's fate. So what does Lamarck get wrong? Kara, what do you think? Uh, how they change over time. They thought they did it individually. How? He gets wrong. How? And what does he get wrong about the how? How quickly? Um, raise your hand. Nick, what do you think? Well, he said that each organism evolves a specific state while it's still alive, and then passes it down to its kids. So that you pass along those traits that you like evolve in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And this is wrong. The idea that I could, you know, do a bunch of weightlifting, take a bunch of protein shakes, power them down, and then get really jacked up and be like, and then have little babies that are like, you know, you can't help out babies. It doesn't work that way. It'd be cool if you could, but that's not how it works. Or that you walk out into the water and get longer legs through stretching and then have babies with longer legs. So you take, you know, you, you take 10 mice and you cut the tails off five of them and you breed them and you see if you have half-tailed mice or no-tailed mice. What do you think? No. No, it didn't work. It didn't work. So he gets wrong how. He says that you can pass along these characteristics to your offspring that you acquire. He calls it the characteristic of... Uh, Acquire characteristics. You don't acquire your characteristics. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little experiment, which is really just replicating what happens in nature. And this is where Darwin finally gets it right. He was already a naturalist. And he spent a lot of time observing nature. And what he notices, especially on this journey around the world, is this. He notices that there's a lot of variation in nature. That even within a group of a population of organisms, that there is natural variation. That things are just slightly a little different from one another. <laughs> and we can look around this room here and we can see that we all have variations. And he notices that's true for everything. And most people would look at butterflies or beetles or squirrels and say, they all look the same. It's not true. There is some slight variation here in these guys. <laughs> what do you think? A yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. Um, now what I want you guys to do, I'm going to hand these back. Who's this one here? Mine. Nick? Miss Stephanie? It's glorious. And... All right. Now what you guys do is we're going to pass these two are right. Just do the person on your right. Person on the end, go ahead and work yours down to the other end. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to make a copy of that person's bird. So try and copy their bird as best you can. On a different sheet of paper? On your second sheet of paper. Yeah. Uh, don't trace it. Try and copy it. Try and copy it. And last time when we did DNA, each time you have an offspring, slightly different. Sometimes even mutations happen. Like you have this one, accidentally was born with claws in the front. Okay? Those usually don't work out in nature. No, no, they generally occur like that, spontaneous. But each variation is just slightly different from the other. Just a little bit different. And this is Darwin's big observation there. So this is where Lamarck kind of missed it. He missed the mark. So one, you have variation, and that two, each set of offspring differ just a little bit from their parents. So that keeps perpetuating this natural variation that we see. Okay, you guys ready for the next level? We're gonna head over to the gym, and we're only gonna take our paper airplanes with us. 
a few moments later. Okay, here's what we're gonna do now. Just using one sheet of paper, we are going to go back to our childhood. So think back to the time yeah. when we used to do this. Yeah, Whenever you had a sheet of paper, some of us, like Riley, were probably doing this with it. <laughs> but someone else turned it back immediately. We're going to make our best paper airplane. Oh, okay. Give us four minutes. Which one are we doing? Just one sheet of paper, just the one. Like there's folds and things that happen. He was the one that won last time. Yeah. yeah. Greater wing loading. Uh, yeah, no, that's not how they fly. Looks like we're almost there. Leave your other sheet of unfolded paper right over in this area here on the floor. We're only gonna take the one airplane you made. The other one, paper should not be folded. Leave that paper here. And we're gonna line up on this line right here, facing this way. All right. to divide us into two groups. You're, you guys can self-divide into two even groups. One group is going to get this airplane. One group is going to get this airplane. And you are then going to have to copy whichever airplane you have in your group. What I would do is put it in the middle of the floor and unfold it. Look at how it's built and put together. And every single person in this group will be copying this plane. Every single person in this group will be trying their best to copy this plane. Five minutes later. So this group over here, you guys right on here, and then the other group over there. Let me see a perfect example of a, a copy here. Riley, do you want it? So, guys, can I get you on the line and to line up, please? Okay. What we have is we have two perfect examples here of two things that work really well, because what's the purpose of paper airplanes again? What are they built to do? And after just one generation, we have two pretty distinct variations here, yet they each flew pretty well. And hold yours out in front of you. Do you guys have variation just within your own little groups now, too? Yes, we do. A little bit, a little bit, but they all look pretty similar, probably. <laughs> 
They all look pretty similar to each other. So now we have two different populations. We see this in birds too. We have one population on one side of a mountain, another population on another. And so you start to see variations in those. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have those fly and migrate this way. Adaptation. Marissa, what do you think adaptation? Um, uh, 
that adapts to it. And well, it adapts to its environment, so it like gets used to its environment. Okay, so gets used to environment. And by used to, you mean? Like changes or something? Changes. Changes to the environment, fits to the environment. And that's what we think, you know, adapt to like a situation. That's kind of turn. Chloe, what's another one you think? Um, a trait that makes it easier to survive in the environment. A trait that makes it, woo! Ooh. So, most of us think this, to get used to your environment. Who's the person, name on the board, that said that organisms change to fit their environment? Totally Lamar. Species acquire characteristics. And what Darwin says is this, is you don't, do these paper airplanes change as we threw them and they flew through the air? Did they get better flying? No. Yeah. Uh, gradual changes to some type of species. It gradual changes. And this is Darwin's idea, is that, look, the individual doesn't change or adapt. We don't see that. We don't throw these paper airplanes and they go, wait a minute, uh, 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 and just change. Out of everything that's born, this is Darwin's big observation, is that out of everything that's born, all of this business, how many actually survive? Two. Two. So the ones that survive, that, that's where we're going with this, yeah. Because what happened is, in the first generation, we had a lot of variation. We had some of those little flappy things there. I mean, kind of flew. <laughs> we had a lot of variation. In the second generation, they looked more and more refined. Because they're the ones that get to pass along those traits. And those are the ones that survive. And just like a frog mass of eggs, how many of those actually are going to grow into big, huge frogs? Two. Two. Not that many. Not that many. And this is Darwin's observation that adaptation are traits that lead to greater survival. But you're born with them. So this is our friend Murray the Mer. Big Phil Mer. They sit on the cliffs. They have one egg each year. And there are thousands of them that gather up on the cliffs. And their eggs have some adaptations. Okay, first adaptation. Which egg do you see better sitting on a cliff right now? If I'm a if I'm a hawk flying over and I'm looking around for something to eat, which one's going to stand out? The white one. Here's the ground. The white. So they tend to blend in pretty well with their environment. They tend to match it. So which one's an adaptation here? Blue. Blue is an adaptation. Now we're going to change the cliff. Here's a white cliff. Put these eggs in here. Which egg am I going to see if I'm flying over? Blue. So now I eat that one. Which egg's left? White. Which egg is going to then, what is this, if this bird survives, what color eggs is it going to lay most likely? White. 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 So that trait gets passed along. It's like with the paper airplanes. We pick the two that survive, then we make copies of those. That's what nature does. Generally, mutations are these gradual changes, okay? Is there variation in, the yeah. Yeah. in height and things like that? Yeah, there's variation. There's always this variation in nature. This is what Darwin observed. The lines, there's slight variations. And that nature picks the best out of the situation. So it doesn't go from that this isn't a consciously driven mechanism. We're not looking to the future saying we need to get better. It just picks out of what's available in the moment. And then those are the ones that survive and pass along those traits. Usually they're gradual changes, yeah. Sometimes mutations happen which lead to, you know, like a big shift or something like but usually those aren't beneficial. It's small ones that pile up. Yeah. So what's the correlation between um, species adapting and DNA? How does that, how does the DNA change to adapt? We're going to get to that. Okay. We're going to get that in just a second. Okay. So there's one adaptation there, the color. What's another adaptation? These birds nest on vertical cliffs. So <clears throat> let's do this. I'm an egg on a cliff. <clears throat> What do we notice that's different about these eggs, aside from their color? The size. Different shapes. So I'm on a cliff right now. I'm going to knock this egg. Ah! What happened to it? Knock. Keeps going towards the edge. Now on this egg, I'm going to knock it. I'm on a vertical cliff. What's happening to it? In circles. It doesn't fall off. Now, if 
an eagle flies over or something like that, the birds scatter, they kick their eggs, the eggs get moved around, which egg's gonna fall off? The white one. The white one. So which egg is going to then stick around? So over time, these gradual changes, and we're not talking going from this to this, but even just a slighter shape that allows you a little smaller radius, are going to be the ones that survive. And they're gonna pass along those characteristics. How do changes in the DNA happen? A small little change of just an A to a C. What will that give you then, if we change that, like a triplet? The amino acid. That'll change the structure of the protein just slightly different. And those subtle changes in proteins lead to physical differences. So it responds to the environment? It's not responding to the environment. It's a random thing that out of all of these, every time you make offspring, there are slight changes and things like that that happen. Okay. And that the environment then picks from that which ones are going to survive. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not changing to fit it, it's just that there's natural variation. Each one of these paper airplanes is just slightly different. They all have a little bit of variation. Each one of our drawings was slightly different. There's all variation. And all that nature does is just shake the box and say, you know, what works best in this situation? And just even those slight differences can lead to greater success. What Darwin says is that adaptation leads to greater survival. In biology, it's still the definition we use. If you don't get them, you're born with them. Now, they could be anything. It's, it doesn't, it's not a predestined, you know, big buff. If the environment said there was predators chasing us, and we live in a forest where all the trees have branches this high, and you had to run away, would being six foot tall and super big be an advantage in that situation? Yeah. And you'd get eaten. Being short little and running fast, that's an adaptation. So there's a lot of variation right now, even in our human population, that we're seeing with seven billion, you know, we're seeing a lot of variation. But again, you know, these are small, subtle changes that we see, you know, hair color, eye color, just, you know, just differences in facial features, things like that. Those, it's not, you're not going to suddenly grow a hand at you. <laughs> so let's take a look at where evolution happens then, because this is another one of Darwin's great observations and insights, is this. Here is, is it, it's linked on here, here's the report that, um, that I did in 2005 on this island I worked on. Here's a picture of a bald eagle. I took that. I'm happy with that picture. That's a bald eagle? <laughs> That's a baby bald eagle, yeah. They're brown until they're two years old. Then they go bald. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. The reports we do, we gather data, and I'm going to show you one of our data tables. Looking at common MERS and thick-billed MERS, and we looked at them across the island, and we had different plots, and we looked at how many laid eggs on each plot, and these are the total number of eggs we got. So how many total eggs did we count this season? 284. Out of our sample size, which was a small fraction of the whole population, we had 284 eggs that we saw get laid. Okay. This is the number that actually hatched into, be, into chicks. How many hatched into chicks then? 202. 202. And we call that our hatching success. So we divide B over A, and we get 71% hatching success here in common MERS. How many of those then survive to be chicks and leave and just head out to the ocean? This is the number that fledged, so the number that left. Is that 152? 54%. 54%. 54%. That's just that leave to be kind of teenagers, you know, to run out. Is it 75%? 75% uh, is the, sorry, fledging success. And that's the total number from this, these over this. The total success, what we call reproductive success. How many eggs laid turn into how many chicks? That's, that, does that make sense? So how many chicks you have, then how many survived to leave, versus how many eggs you have, how many survived to leave. And so 54 we know made it to be teenagers. This is one year. That's half, half survived. It's actually a good, a good number. These birds live to be 50 years old. They can and that's where, uh, that's where it stops. That's where all my footage cuts out. I don't exactly remember what happened uh, that caused me to lose the final, like, 10 minutes of that. I would like to believe that over the years of having to move the files from computer to computer, they just got lost or corrupted and ended up deleting it at some point before this last week. Anyways, that's all the footage I have. Uh, I'm sorry it took so long to actually edit this down. It was just in the back of my mind for the longest time, and I finally found the files again, and I decided that it, would, it, was, it was finally time. Well, and I'm pretty sure that the point uh, he was trying to make was that the MERS uh, that got to live got to, to pass down those traits to uh, their offspring, and their offspring would pass down the traits that would allow them to survive even better in that environment to their offspring. So basically, um, it just supports the idea that you change according to the environment through traits that are passed down from 
uh, the ancestors that were able to actually survive in that environment. Or something like that. Anyways, I'll just, uh, I'll leave you with this.